Okay, so let's quickly go through these here, guys. So calcium sulfide. All right, we see uh, sulfur right here on our um, solubility chart, and calcium does appear in the first row, so that is soluble. Okay. Um, uh, Kennedy, can I get you to turn that light off? Thanks. Okay, um, potassium hydroxide, number three. So we've got uh, hydroxide, and we see that uh, potassium is also in that first row, so that one is also soluble. Okay, lead to chloride. Okay, uh, we see chlorine, it's about uh, three over from the left hand side. It says it's soluble with most things, but we do see that lead with the two plus charge is in the lower row. Okay, so that one is insoluble, and you will find that oftentimes lead is with when lead is in an ionic compound that that compound has a very low solubility. Okay, lead just has a tendency to be that way. Yeah. Then we would probably have to say that yes, it is. Lead four is incredibly rare, so it's not something that's going to be in compounds very often. Yes, this only works for ionic compounds. Yeah. Okay, um, and you can see that it says right here at the. I mean, the title is solubility of some common ionic compounds. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for tin, uh, tin four fluoride. Fluoride is second uh, second column over, soluble with most things, and we do not see SN listed in that lower row with a few other things. So we can assume that that one is soluble. Copper two sulfide. Okay, it says sulfide is um, soluble with uh, about seven things, or six or seven things there, but it is insoluble with most things. Since copper is not listed in the first row, we have to assume that this one's insoluble. Uh, we got potassium fluoride. Okay, um, so potassium. We got fluoride here. It says soluble with most things. Uh, but not with lithium, magnesium, calcium, blah, blah, blah. But potassium's not listed in there, so that one's soluble. Okay, silver fluoride. All right, so we were just at silver again. Or sorry, we were just at fluoride. Again, silver's not listed in that lower row, so we would assume that silver is part of most and is soluble. And 11, beryllium nitrate. We said pretty much everything is soluble with nitrate, and we can confirm that, that only those big, long, weird ionic things at the bottom, okay, are insoluble with nitrate, so that one's soluble. All right. Expect that you're probably going to be asked to do that on a quiz or on a multiple choice question on a test or in a lab, okay, things like that. Being able to use your solubility chart is important. Okay, moving on to chemical equations, writing chemical equations. Okay. So we got to learn the signs of a chemical change. We should probably say review the signs of a chemical change because I sincerely hope everyone remembers those all right, from Science 9, but we'll quickly go over them. Okay. Um, so what are the signs of a chemical change? What are some things that we might see? Okay, there might be a precipitate. Okay, what else? Right, a change in temperature. So I'm going to use this symbol here. Um, Okay, delta. Delta means change. All right, it's a Greek symbol. That's the letter D in Greek. Change in color. All right. Okay, there could be a gas formed. What are some signs of a gas being formed? Two things that we might use as an indicator a gas has been formed. Daniel? Bubbles and... Odor. Okay. Sometimes a gas will be released and there'll be no bubbles. Right? Sometimes it just honestly seeps right out. You don't see any evidence that of the bubbling and fizzing, but there's just suddenly this really sharp, acrid odor. Right? It often happens when ammonia is produced. Okay? Ammonia doesn't seem to ever have bubbles. It just seems to suddenly have this really strong, sharp smell. Has anyone ever had smelling salts cracked to in front of them? Okay, if you weight lift, like the, that's the thing you see, if you ever watch like Olympic weightlifting, okay, right before those guys go out, they snap this thing and put it under their nose and you can just watch them go, <laughs> okay, because it smells so awful, it makes their adrenaline pump and then they go lift crazy weights. Okay. Watch it sometime. Okay. Um, so gas forms, okay, the, the gas that's in those smelling salts is, is ammonia, it's really sharp. It's, if you've ever smelt Windex, that's the smell of ammonia, okay, that's what it smells like, except way stronger than that. 
All right, uh, so we got color change, precipitate, change in temperature, gases, anything else? There could be a change in state, yes. Yeah, there could be. So that could be a precipitate is an example of a change in state. A gas being formed is a change in state. A liquid being formed could be a change in state. Okay, all of those are examples. That's also a sign of a physical change, but it can happen in chemical changes as well. Yeah, we have new materials. That's the big thing. Okay, there's going to be new materials formed. And these are the signs that a new material is formed because the new materials will have different physical properties than the ones we started with. That's why we see different colors, different odors, okay, different solubility. All those things we did in the lab that we used as, as physical property indicators, okay, those things can change. And when we see a change in them, that means we've got something we didn't have before. All right, we're going to look at the, the uh, types of chemical reactions. We're going to know how to identify each reaction type. They are distinct. They have certain... Um, sort of patterns that go along with them, and then we're going to look at how we write them. Okay, write them, balance them, and then later on, probably next week, we'll start looking at predicting them, okay, so we can predict what things will be formed in a chemical reaction. That's where we'll be headed to. Okay, questions on any of that? All right. All right, so in a chemical reaction, the final products are different, chemically different. Okay, then the starting reactants, and these are two terms you'll need to know, okay, products and reactants. So if I have an example kind of chemical reaction here, um, let's just say something like this. In a chemical reaction like that, and that's a simple acid-base reaction, these are your reactants. These are your products. Okay, the reactants are the things that react, the products are the things that are produced, so it sort of makes sense. Okay. So our final products are chemically different from our starting reactants. Now, a chemical change, unlike a physical change, cannot be reversed, okay? at least not without the input of extraordinary amounts of energy. Right? A campfire is an example of a chemical reaction or a chemical change. I can't unburn the wood after the fire. Okay? I can't get the unburned wood back after that. That chemical reaction has happened. Okay? The oxygen that was in the air has been consumed and it has turned into carbon dioxide. Okay? The, uh, the hydrocarbons that were in the wood have been turned into carbon dioxide and water vapor. They're not there anymore. I, can't, I have to go out and capture them all somehow. And you just can't do that. Okay? Those products are gone. Okay? And now you have something that is chemically different than what you started with. Everybody with me there? Okay, so you generally are not going to be reversing chemical reactions. Are there chemical reactions that can be reversed? Yes. If you have rechargeable batteries at home, you are reversing a chemical reaction when you recharge them. Okay, it's a redox kind of reaction. Okay, but electricity is released when the reaction is allowed to occur normally, and then when you plug it in, the energy allows those, those uh, electrons to go back to where they were originally and recharge the battery. Okay, so it's a chemical reaction that you can undo Okay, by adding electricity to it. And the reason you can undo it is all the stuff stays in the battery, none of it escapes. All right, so then all that product is kind of there. All right, questions so far on that? Okay, so really important that we know reactants and products. Okay, so the five types of chemical reactions. We'll start out with the simplest ones. Okay, the simplest kind of chemical reaction is called a synthesis reaction. And in a synthesis reaction, we're doing just like it sounds. We are making a single compound out of two starting materials, usually elements, but sometimes it might be an element and, a comp and, and another compound. Okay? In the end, we will only have one product. Okay? A synthesis reaction only ever has one product. And like 99% of the time, it's two elements reacting to form a compound. OK, 
Okay, so in the reactions we've got here, okay, our example reaction, our first one is that I've got magnesium in a solid form, so a strip of magnesium metal, reacting with oxygen gas, so basically I leave it out in the air, okay, and it turns into magnesium oxide, which is kind of a black powder, right, that just oxidizes when you leave magnesium out, right, and that's also a solid. Okay, everyone with me there? So I've got a element reacting with an element, and that forms a single compound. Okay. What are the big numbers for? What's the what are the twos for? Anybody know? The twos are there to balance the reaction, which is something we're gonna learn about today as well. We balance a reaction so that we don't make matter or we don't destroy matter. Okay? You guys heard the law of conservation of mass or law of conservation of matter. Matter can't be created, it can't be destroyed. Okay? These numbers make sure that I'm not doing that. Make sure I have exactly the same number of atoms on both sides of the chemical reaction. A chemical reaction can't destroy matter. All right? So on this side, I've got two magnesium atoms. On this side, I've got two oxygen atoms. Okay? And on this side, I've got two magnesium atoms and two oxygen atoms. Okay, the big two here means multiply everything in this compound by two, or there are two molecules of magnesium oxide is basically what it's saying. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Right, so we put those big numbers in in order to uh, balance the reaction. All right, now at this point, some people will say to me, well, Mr. Coder, couldn't I just do this? And the answer is no. That would be a different compound than MgO, not the same thing. Okay, we want to say we have two molecules of MgO. Right, this this molecule doesn't exist. Right, we can't just go making stuff up. Right, right, we swap and drop those two things to make MgO because it's an ionic compound. Okay, another example here. I've got potassium reacting with bromine. Okay, and so that's two molecule or sorry, two atoms of potassium right here. Okay, and they're reacting with a single molecule of bromine. That molecule contains how many atoms of bromine? Two. Okay, and that's going to form two molecules. Okay, this one here and that one there. Okay, of potassium bromide. Why is bromine written like that? If you look at your periodic table, you will probably find bromine was one of the things we highlighted very early on. All right. This is where that highlighting is going to become important. Bromine, along with oxygen, nitrogen, a bunch of other things on our periodic table, are what we call the molecular elements. Did we not do that? I'm looking at a bunch of people's periodic tables. We did? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, if yours isn't highlighted, okay, on the periodic table, you need to highlight nitrogen over to fluorine. So nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and everything in column 17. Okay, those are the molecular elements that come in pairs, or the binary. Okay, uh, molecular elements. Uh, hydrogen is also a binary molecular element. And then you've got phosphorus. Okay, it comes as a uh, set of four. Okay, so it's a tetrad uh, molecular element. And then this is an octet. Sulfur is an octet. All right, comes as S8 when it is by itself, okay? And that's for all of them. When they're by themselves, like bromine was here, it comes as a two. When it's in a compound, it can come as any number. In this case, it had to be a one because the swap and drop said it had to be a one, right? So that little number doesn't carry over necessarily, okay? So we need to know which ones are the molecular elements so that when we write a chemical reaction, we write them the right way, okay? Because writing this and writing this mean two different things. Okay? This means a molecule of bromine on top. This means two single atoms of bromine, which you just don't see. It just doesn't happen. Okay? So one's right and one's not. Okay? So make sure you're always looking at your periodic table if you're writing elements by themselves. And check make sure they're not special elements. Okay, so synthesis, two elements form a compound. The opposite of synthesis is decomposition. Okay. Our reactant, and there's only one reactant in a synthesis or in a uh, decomposition reaction, is a single compound, and that single compound breaks down 
into into its parts or into its constituent elements. All right. So the uh, example we have at the top there is how you produce rocket fuel. You take water, you arc electricity through it, and it splits the hydrogen and oxygen atoms apart. Okay, and you get a molecule of hydrogen and a molecule, actually you get two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen out of doing that. Okay, and then as a result, you've got these two highly explosive gases separated from each other. Okay, that's of course why we use it for rocket fuel. It's highly explosive when you put it together. Okay. Everyone following me so far? Okay, so when we're looking at that one, remember, the, the kind of defining feature of a De decomposition reaction is a single reactant. Every other reaction type has more than one reactant. Because otherwise, what's it going to react with? Okay, so this is the only kind of reaction that has only one reactant. Okay, our other example here would be two molecules of nitrogen triiodide. Okay, so we got one nitrogen atom here in the middle, and then our three iodine atoms around the side of it, okay, and there's two molecules of that, and it breaks down into a single molecule of nitrogen containing how many atoms? Two. Okay, and three molecules of iodine. Right? Both of those are special elements, and decomposition reactions are one of the reactions where you always have to look for those special elements, okay? Because on a test, this is one of the ones I see people mess up. They forget that these are special, and they write this like this instead. They go 2Ni3 gives 2N plus 6I. Okay? And while they might make the argument, Mr. Coderre, I balanced it. It's balanced. I have to make the argument, you balanced it, but it's not right. Okay? Iodine comes as a pair. Nitrogen comes as a pair. You didn't write them that way. Right. Question? Oh, those are the states of matter. Um, I, I do that out of habit. You guys do not need to write the states of matter in a chemical reaction. So your reactions will look more like this. Okay, more like the second one here. All right, uh, so this is H2O L liquid. Okay, becomes H2 gas, O2 gas. All right, you guys don't have to worry about that. It's just force a habit for me to write them that way. Okay. All right, so questions on how a decomposition reaction works. All right, and oh, see there, I was going to talk about the molecular elements, and I forgot I had that on there. But you already highlighted them, so you're good. Okay, so just remember, okay, quick highlighting, anything that's green, okay, that's a 2. Okay, this one comes as a 4, and this one comes as an 8. Okay, when they are by themselves, all right, when they're in a compound, they can be any number. All right, just uh, keep those ones in mind. Okay, combustion reactions. A combustion reaction is very distinctive. It's the only reaction type that will have what we call a hydrocarbon. That's this. Okay, a hydrocarbon is a compound that contains carbon and hydrogen. It's fuel, basically. Okay, hydrocarbons are what we get, what we use for fuels. So it's a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen gas. Right? We all know that in order for fire to be present, oxygen has to be present. Right? So this is a fuel, a hydrocarbon, burning in the presence of oxygen, and the products are always the same. It doesn't matter what hydrocarbon you have here. The products will always be carbon dioxide and water. Okay? The only thing that will be different is how much carbon dioxide and water is produced. The bigger the hydrocarbon, the more waste it produces when it is burned. Okay. All right, so the nice thing about combustion reactions is you don't have to think about what the products are. You just have to remember, always carbon dioxide and water. Sorry, question? Okay. All right, and this is why, guys, if you've ever noticed in the wintertime when you're behind somebody's car at a stoplight, you sometimes will see water dripping out of the exhaust pipe. Okay? That's because it's so cold that the water vapor produced in the combustion reaction has had a chance to condense into liquid water before it gets out of the uh, exhaust system and it actually drips out of the car. Okay? So when you burn something in a perfect combustion reaction, these are your only two products. 
Okay? The problem with, with vehicles is obviously the combustion reaction is not perfect, and there are additives to fuel and things like that that end up making other gases that come out of the back of the car. Okay? But we deal with it worked perfectly and only produced these ones. Okay? All right, so in this reaction, we've got C3H8, which is commonly known as propane. So if you have a barbecue at home, okay, it has the big white tank and doesn't hook up to the house, okay, it's using propane, um, and it is reacting with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, there's a little bit of trick here for balancing combustion reactions. Okay, you might want to... We, I know we haven't talked about balancing yet, but we're going to write down just a couple of things here about balancing a combustion reaction. All right, so let's just go down. Okay, when you balance a chemical reaction, you want to make sure you got the same number of things on both sides. Okay, that way we don't create matter, you don't destroy matter. So the same number of carbons on the reactant side as you have on the product side. Right? So let's start with carbon, because in a combustion reaction, okay, rule number one is that we balance alphabetically. Right? And these rules, guys, only apply to combustion reactions. They have special balancing rules. Everything else balances way easier. Okay? Balance alphabetically. Okay, and then the second rule is what we call the rule of two, okay, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, on this side, how many carbon atoms are there? There are three. Okay, how many carbon atoms are there on this side? One. Remember, this little two only applies to the oxygen, right? The little numbers only apply to the element they're right beside. The big numbers apply to the whole compound. All right, so if there's three carbon on this side, I need to make sure that there are three on that side. So I put a big three. I can't put little threes because that changes the compound, right? I can't go C little three O2 because now it's not carbon dioxide anymore. It's something else. Everyone follow me there? You can't change the materials. You can change how much of the material there, there is. So now my carbons work. How many hydrogen are on this side? Eight. How many are over here? What times two will give me eight? Four. All right, so I put a four here. Now I've got eight hydrogens. All right, now I've got to balance my oxygens. When I balance oxygen, I don't want to start over here. I want to start over here, okay, on the, on the product side, because oxygen's in two places. Right? So I want to add those oxygens together so I know what number to put over here on the reactant side. Everyone with me there? All right. How many oxygens in, in the three carbon dioxide molecules? Six. Okay. And four times one is four. So four plus six is? Okay. So I got ten oxygens. What number do I need to put here? Five. Exactly. Okay. That's how we balance. All right. It's, it's a similar thing for other kinds of reactions. You just don't have to balance other reactions alphabetically. Okay. You have to balance combustion reactions alphabetically, because if you try to balance oxygen first, you're going to be starting over, and over, and over, and it'll never work. You always balance oxygen last, because it screws everything up if you don't. All right. Now, the second rule is called the rule of two, and it applies when you have a compound that looks like this. you have an even number of carbons, the rule of two applies. I'm going to show you why. Okay? How many carbons here? Okay, so what do I need to put here? Four. All right. And how many hydrogens here? Okay, so what needs to go here? All right, now that's going to create a problem. I've got five oxygens plus eight oxygens, which is 13. What times two gives me 13? Nothing. Not any whole number, anyway. Okay? Six and a half would get me, but I can't have half a molecule. Right? We talked about that simple whole number ratio as part of Dalton's atomic theory. I can't have decimals here. So, I need to get rid of these numbers. Okay? And start with a two. Hence the rule of two. Okay? If you have an even number of carbons, 
start your balancing with a two. All right. So the rule of two is, okay, even number of carbon start with two. All right. And that's going to take care of our little decimal problem because when you multiply a half by two, you get one, which is a whole number, and that's what we want. Okay, how many carbon over here now? Eight. All right, so I'm going to put an eight here. How many hydrogen here now? Twenty. So what needs to go here? Ten, right? Okay, now we can look at the oxygens. Ten oxygens here and sixteen here. Ten plus sixteen is twenty-six. What times two gives me twenty-six? 13. Now it works. Now it's all whole numbers. Okay? That's why we have the rule of two. Okay? You only have to use the rule of two when you have an even number of carbons. Okay? All right. So I taught you how to balance with the hardest examples of balancing. Okay? The other kind of balancing are much easier. Any question? How I got 13? Okay. I added all the oxygens on the product side. So I went, there's 10 oxygens in the water. Right, because 10 times 1 is 10. And then I went, there's 8 times 2 oxygens in the, in the uh, carbon dioxide. So 16 plus 10 is 26. So there's 26 oxygens on the, on the product side. I need to have 26 oxygens on this side. 13 times 2 is 26. No, we'll be doing the, the uh, regular balancing with all of the reactions. We just don't have to use these two rules. Balancing is actually a little easier for the other kinds of reactions. You can kind of start wherever you want and just go back and forth till it's balanced. We'll go over that. Okay, now, these last two reaction types are both replacement reactions. Okay? The thing about replacement reactions is they always and only involve ionic compounds and elements. There will never be molecular compounds in replacement reactions. It cannot happen. Okay, so replacement reactions always involve ionic compounds and elements. You will never get a molecular compound in an ionic or in a replacement reaction. Okay. The first kind of replacement reaction is what we call single replacement. Because we only have one ionic compound to start with, and it's reacting with an element. And they're going to replace each other in the chemical reaction. All right? So in this reaction here that we've got, okay, we've got copper solid, okay, so a piece of copper, a penny, okay, something like that. And it's being placed into a solution of silver nitrate. Okay? Um, that reaction will begin to occur, and what will happen is, is the silver and the copper will switch places. They will replace each other. Okay. Now, how do we know which thing replaces the other? Well, if this thing here is a metal, it replaces the metal. Because right? if it doesn't, I won't get an ionic compound on the other side. Okay. If copper replaced nitrate, I'd have silver and copper together. Can I have two metals chemically bonded together? I can't. Okay. And I already said it won't produce a molecular compound, so you couldn't have two nonmetals together either. Right. So we're always going to produce okay, a ionic compound or two ionic compounds on the product side. So in this case, I replace the things that are alike. So in this case, the metals switch places. Okay. If this was a non-metal, and I'll give you an example of that, it would replace the polyatomic ion or the non-metal. Okay. All right, so on this side now, after the reaction, I've got solid silver and a solution of copper nitrate. Okay. Now, this reaction, when you run it, okay, looks like this. You put a piece of copper in this clear solution. When you come back the next day, the solution is blue and the penny is covered in silver. It plates out onto the, onto the penny or the copper wire or whatever piece of copper you threw in there. Okay? It actually plates out because the, the copper and silver are switching places. Right? So you would end up with like a silver penny. 
Okay, it, it is, it's actually it's cool when it works, but you have to have really concentrated silver nitrate. And here's the problem: you can use silver nitrate to make silver. Is silver valuable? So so is silver nitrate. It's not cheap to buy. Okay, you can't get rich on this reaction. Okay, and people are like, because I can see the wheels turning for a few of you there. Okay, You're like I just gotta get my hands on the silver nitrate. Probably buy that at Walmart. No, you can't. Okay, you can't buy silver nitrate at Walmart. Silver nitrate's expensive because it's got silver in it. Okay, and yeah, so as a result, it's like the most expensive thing we have in the lab. All right, um, so that's the reaction there. Okay, and you can see we get on this side a new element by itself and a new ionic compound. Right? And because it's copper containing, the solution turns blue. Okay? Again, a sign a chemical reaction has occurred. The copper, the penny change color, and the solution change color. Okay? So an indication indications of a chemical change. All right, another example of a single replacement reaction could involve a nonmetal reacting with an ionic compound. So I could have, let's say, chlorine gas reacting with, um, let's say, I don't know if that reaction would happen in reality, but we'll just use it as an example. Okay, I've got chlorine gas being like bubbled through, okay, uh, a solution of lithium oxide, right? Chlorine, metal or non-metal? Non-metal. So who's it going to replace? Oxygen. So on this side, who gets left by themselves? Oxygen. Okay. Is oxygen special? It is. That's one of those things we always got to look for. Okay. So it's going to be O2 on this side, right? And that's going to leave me with what's the compound going to be? Lithium chloride. Okay. Now I'm making up this, so I got to drop and swap it. That's a minus one. This is a plus one. So Okay, that works out. It's LiCl. Now what do I have to do? I got to balance the equation. I got more lithium on this side than I do on that side. All right? So I got to go over here and look at this and say, okay, there's two lithium here. I could put a two over there and balance it, but then what else isn't going to work? Oxygen. So there's two oxygen here. What should I put in front of this? I'm going to put a two there. Okay? So now I've got two oxygen, but I got how many lithium? Four. Okay, so I put a four there. How many chlorine do I have over there? Four. What do I need here? Two. Okay, so you kind of go back and forth, back and forth until you got it all balanced. That's how balancing works. Okay, so you got to do a little bit of math, but it's like easy math. Okay. Making sense? All right, so that's, that's a single replacement reaction. Element. Reacts with ionic compound to produce, right? So you might just want to write the pattern down, okay? Okay, so and we might want to say like element A reacts with ionic compound A to produce element B and ionic compound B just so you know that they're different. Otherwise there's no reaction, right? You'd have the same element, the same ionic compound, it means nothing happened. Alright, so the example I always use for um, a replacement reaction is like this picture here. Okay, you got these Two people dancing, this guy and this girl dancing, and this this guy that is, you know, kind of watching, decides he likes the girl. So he goes over and he rolls the guy, takes off with his girl, and the other guy ends up by himself. Okay? Someone got replaced, okay, in that chemical reaction. All right? Now, again, you got to remember, and the reason I use this boy-girl example, okay, is because you only end up with boy and girl together in the compound, a metal and a non-metal. You can't end up with a molecular compound, all right? You can't end up with two girls together. You can't end up with two guys together, okay? Because chemistry is really old-fashioned and doesn't like that, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that in real life, but in chemistry, chemistry is very old-fashioned. It does not like that. OK, 
Okay, so questions on the single replacement. All right, so the next kind is double replacement. So instead of having an element and a compound, it's now two compounds, two ionic compounds. They've got to be ionic or this doesn't work. All right, so our example is calcium chloride reacts with sodium carbonate, and I get two new ionic compounds because in every double replacement reaction, I swap the metals. Okay, by swapping the metals, I'll get two new ionic compounds on the other side. Okay, so this would be two couples dancing and they switch partners. That's all there is to it. Now you have two new couples. You still have ionic compounds, metal and non-metal. Okay. Right, so in this one here, calcium's new partner on this side is carbonate. Sodium's new partner on this side is chlorine. Okay. Everybody all right with that? All right, so if you see a reaction and it's all ionic compounds, you know it's a double replacement reaction. Okay. It's the only kind of reaction that'll start that way. Okay, so each one of the five reactions we've gone over has some feature about it that is identifiable. Right? A synthesis reaction always starts with two elements. A decomposition reaction always starts with one compound. Right? Combustion reaction is always hydrocarbon and oxygen. Single replacement is element and ionic compound. Double replacement ionic compound, ionic compound. Okay? They all have a different set of reactants, and that's how we identify them. That's important because when we get to predicting the products of a reaction, we'll only have the reactants in front of us, and we'll have to know, oh, that's a double replacement reaction because it's two ionic compounds. Now I know what to do. I know what the products will be now. All right? If you can't identify the reaction type, it's pretty hard to predict what the products are going to be. Okay, let's look at a second example of a double replacement reaction here. Let's look at um, Okay, so I've got lithium chloride reacting with lead 2 nitrate. Who is lithium going to end up with on the other side? NO3, right. It's got to end up with the non-metal or the negatively charged, whoops, negatively charged polyatomic ion. Okay, so I go Li, NO3, and that means then that lead has to end up with chlorine. Now, here's where I start to see people make mistakes. They forget what order they're supposed to write these in, and they write the non-metal first. Is that the way we do it? It's always the metal first and then ionic compound, right? But I see people make that mistake. The place where I see it happen the most is in a synthesis reaction. Okay? I burn people on this on a quiz every year. I'll go into it after we balance this one. Okay? Um, all right. Lithium on this side, how many? One. How many over there? One. Okay. How many chlorine on this side? One. How many over here? Ah, wrong. I didn't, what did I not do to this? I didn't swap and drop, right? See, really important to always check that. Um, would it matter to which one you have chloride No, the order of the compounds doesn't matter. If I put lead chloride first, that's fine. As long as I don't put chlorine before lead. Yeah, okay? So this should be PBCL2, properly swapped and dropped. So there's one chlorine over here, but there are two over here. So what needs to go in front of this? Two. Okay, remember, I can't put a little 2 here. That changes the compound. Now that gives me how many lithium? 2. So that's what you do. When you're balancing, you make one thing balance and then fix the thing that that screwed up because that's usually what happens. When you balance one thing, it screws up something else. So I go back over here, and I've got to put a 2 there. Everybody all right with that? Okay, now how many nitrate does that give me? 2. Always a good sign that you're doing something right, okay? If when you did this, it made something on the other side go into balance, then you're on the right track. So now my nitrates are balanced. How many lead here? One. How many lead over there? One. Is everything balanced now? We're good. 
Okay, so that's how the balancing works. All right, let me show you an example of a place where I burn people on that writing the compounds out of order thing. Okay, I did this. I said, uh, what was it? I think I went. And I said, predict the products. Right? What kind of reaction starts with two elements? Synthesis reaction. So, oh, okay, I got to make a compound out of that. OK2 is not OK. Right? Because that's not how you write an ionic compound. But because I wrote it non metal first and metal second, which is fine. They wrote it that way over here. Instead of going, hey, potassium is a metal, and metals are always listed first in an ionic compound, KO minus 2 plus 1, swap and drop, this should be K2O. Okay? Watch out for that. I only have so many tricks, and I like to use them over and over again. Okay? So watch out for that one. Okay, questions on that one? Now, when we write a chemical reaction, we want to communicate a few things. You guys don't have to worry about the states of matter, so you can ignore the G's and L's and AQ's. Okay? What we want to communicate is the number of everything. That's why we do the balancing. Right? When we write out a chemical reaction, we determine the small numbers by the names given to us, and we use the prefixes, or by swapping and dropping ionic compounds. That's how we determine those small numbers. Once those are written, we can't change them. We can only change how much of everything there is by adding in these numbers here, okay, which are called coefficients. Okay, because a coefficient is something you multiply by. Right? So those are our coefficients. Right? So in this case here, right, we've got how many uh, how many nitrogens in this reaction? Okay, so there's three on this side. How many are there on that side? Well, there's how many here? Two, and there's how many there? So does it still add up to three? Always got to look for that. It's possible for an element to end up in two different compounds when you're balancing. Okay, and so you got to, it's the total on one side and the total on the other side. All right, so you got to look. When we did the combustion reaction, we had oxygen in two places, right? We added them together. That's what we did here, right? And we got uh, how many oxygen on this side? Three times two is six, plus one more is seven, okay? Two times three is six, plus one more is seven. Okay, so we're good there. And with our hydrogens, there's two here and there's two there. Right? So it's all balanced out. But you gotta always be looking, are there things that are in more than one place? Okay, so reading chemical reactions is pretty important. You gotta be able to tell how much of everything there is. All right. Here's what I want you to do with these ones. Okay? I want you to identify the reaction type, synthesis, decomposition, double replacement, whatever it happens to be. Okay? And then I want you to balance it and then write it out in words. Okay? So writing essentially the names of the things that are in it. All right? On a unit exam, you can expect to get probably three or four questions just like that. Okay, where you would get like a mark for writing out the reactants properly in words, a mark for writing out the products properly in words, a mark for the reaction type, and a mark for balancing. Okay, be a four mark question. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes on that, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so our first reaction here, I've got nitrogen. All right, so for writing it out in words, this is simply nitrogen because it's how it appears as an element. Right? It's one of the molecular elements. I don't change its name any. It's still just nitrogen. Okay? And same with the hydrogen. So it's reacting with, we just put plus hydrogen. Okay? And that's going to produce nitrogen trihydride. Right? It's a molecular compound because it starts with a non-metal. Okay? Hydrogen is listed second in that. Right? Nitrogen trihydride is also known as ammonia. That's the really smelly stuff. Okay. All right, what kind of reaction is that? 
It's a synthesis reaction, right? Starts with two elements and forms a single compound. So it's a synthesis reaction. And now we've got a balance. Okay? I've got uh, two nitrogens over here and only one over there. And then I've got this odd number of hydrogens and an even number. Well, the quickest way to turn an odd number into an even number is to multiply by two. That also happens to balance my nitrogens. Okay? So now I've got two nitrogens. The nitrogen works. And I've got six hydrogens. So what needs to go here? Three. And now the reaction is balanced. All right, the second one should be easy because it was the example for a, what kind of reaction? Single replacement reaction. Right? This is a single replacement reaction. Okay, and we've got copper reacting with silver nitrate to produce silver and copper nitrate. Now I've got a balance. The only thing right now in that reaction that isn't balanced is what? Nitrate. Here's the trick. You balance a polyatomic ion as a single unit. Don't try and balance the oxygens and the nitrogens separately. They're always going to be together, so don't bother. Okay? Always do them together. Okay? There's two nitrates over here, and there's only one. Right? Nitrate is NO3. Agreed? Okay. There are two NO3s on this side. There's only one NO3. That's what I said. Don't split it up. Okay. So I'm going to put a 2 here. That will make sure I have two nitrates on both sides. How many silver does that give me? 2. So what needs to go here? 2. Okay. And now the reaction is balanced because there's one copper and one copper. Right? So whenever you have a polyatomic ion, balance it as a single unit. Okay? Very rarely do polyatomic ions break up okay, in a reaction. So they always stay together. Treat them like an element. Okay? And remember, because I know a few of you said there were three. Remember, this three doesn't mean three nitrates. It means three oxygens. All right? That's why we want to balance nitrate all as one piece rather than in, in parts. Okay. Keep going there, guys. I'll give you a few more minutes before I do the next one. Okay, let's look at uh, three and four here. Okay, what kind of reaction am I looking at on number three? It's a combustion reaction. I've got carbon and hydrogen reacting with oxygen. It's producing water and carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's combustion. Okay, writing out the names, this would be carbon tetrahydride or ammonia, or I mean not ammonia, I mean methane. Okay, so fart gas. Okay, plus oxygen. And it gives water. And you can call it water. You don't have to give it a technical name. Everybody knows that H2O is water, right? It's the only thing you can use a common name for. Right, plus carbon dioxide. Okay. Do I have an odd number or an even number of carbons? Odd. Okay, so I don't have to use the rule of two here. One carbon over here, one carbon over there. It's a good start. Okay, I got four hydrogens over here, only two here. So what needs to go here? Okay, now I look at my oxygens. There's two oxygens here, and there's two more there for a total of what needs to go in front of oxygen here? Right. Okay, making sense? All right. Uh, and then our next one here was also an example of a decomposition reaction in your notes. Okay, so it's decomp. And when we're naming it, it's water. Breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. All right, give you a few minutes to finish up the last three here, and then we'll go over them together. Okay, sorry, balancing. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to balance it. Um, all right, so on this side here, okay, so far, hydrogen's balanced, but on this side, there are two oxygens. Okay, so I need to put a two here to balance the oxygens, but when I do that, it gives me how many hydrogen? Four. So I need to put a 
two there. Okay, remember, I can't put in small numbers. If I put in the little numbers, I change the compound. I can only change how much of the compound there is. All right? Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so we've got a reaction where we've got chlorine reacting with sodium iodide. That produces iodine and sodium chloride. All right, what kind of reaction is that? Single replacement, right. Okay, um, so in balancing that reaction, I've got two chlorine over here, but I've only got one on the product side, so I need to put what in front of this? Two. Okay, and do I need to do the same thing over here now? Yeah, because when I put that two there, it also made two sodium. So I put two sodium there, and that happens to make my ion, iodine work out. Okay, so remember, the naming here, chlorine, right? We don't say dichloride, this is chlorine, it's an element. Yes, there's two atoms there, okay, but that doesn't change its name. Same with iodine, right? It's one of our special molecular elements. When it comes as a pair, when it's by itself, it doesn't change the name. Okay. All right. Uh, questions on that one? All right. So next one down, I've got calcium chloride reacts with sodium carbonate to produce calcium carbonate and sodium chloride. All four are ionic compounds, so this is a double replacement reaction. Okay. Now for balancing. All right. Look for things that are out of balance. It looks like chlorine and sodium have two on this side, but only one on that side. So what do I need to put in front of sodium chloride? A two. And when I do that, am I finished? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure I am finished. Right? Everything else is a one. There's one calcium here. There's one calcium here. There's two chlorine. Now there's two chlorine, two sodium, two sodium, one carbonate one carbonate. Okay? Remember, don't let that little three on the carbonate fool you. There's only one carbonate. Carbonate is CO3. Okay? All right. And then our last one, okay, what kind of reaction is the last one? It's, yeah, it's also a double replacement. Everything in this reaction is written, at least, as an ionic compound. Right? This stuff may be written as an ionic compound, but we more commonly know it as Water. Water can be written as an ionic compound because it does occasionally behave that way. All right? So HOH is still two H's and one O, H2O. Okay? It's still just water. All right? Once in a while we write it that way because it's easier to keep track of where everything goes. So if you've got an ionic compound on one side with OH, you might get HOH on the other, and it's easier to keep track of where everything went by writing it that way as opposed to H2O. All right. In terms of balancing... Do I need to do anything with this? If there are no small numbers, it's balanced, all right? Because everything is a is a single. One hydrogen, one potassium, one chlorine, everything's a one. So I don't need to do any balancing. So we've got hydrogen chloride, potassium hydroxide, water, and potassium chloride, okay, as our compounds there. All right, reminder, your lab reports are due tomorrow. Okay, so make sure that if you want me to look them over, you pop in in scheduled help or the second half of lunch today because I'm in parking lot supervision on the first half. Um, you will also have a quiz that will be posted later. It will just be on naming and solubility, so it will be easy, easy. Okay, it's all stuff you've already done before. This is a double replacement.